Hi everyone, welcome to Mental Health Mondays. I am Carrie Biscalonis, founder of Reset Brain and Body, an integrative mental health care practice located in Plymouth, serving both Plymouth area and the entire state of Michigan with in-person and online counseling. So I want to talk to you about something that has been in your chats and DMs and people have been talking about, and it is generational trauma. What the heck is it? And who does it affect? So first of all, every single person has generational trauma. I want to repeat that. Every single person has generational trauma. So if you go back hundreds of years, thousands of years, there has been trauma affecting every single person. And it's important not to judge the trauma or um, compete with the level of trauma, but we're talking about histories of oppression of so many different cultures and peoples. We're talking about war and famine. We're talking about really systemic and cultural events that shook entire generations. And so even if you are someone that is a fourth generation Caucasian American, maybe Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, either way, someone who maybe Someone would say, well, there's no way you have generational trauma. Well, the thing about it is that it doesn't matter how recent the, the most recent generation had the trauma. What matters is how then that trickles down generation after generation. So let's go through an example. And I think this is one that can be pretty easy to understand for most people because it's pretty, it's pretty simple if you think about it. So let's talk about World War II. So a lot of World War II veterans are uh, 90s, 100s, um, pretty old, but you might still have a grandparent or maybe even your own parent who was a veteran or someone that you knew. Now, more likely than not, this is someone that was raised around the Depression era. And so their beginnings was something of a traumatic childhood where there was a lot of scarcity and fear, not a lot of safety and certainty about not only their financial stability, but even where are they going to get their next meal? Uh, are they actually safe going home? Things like that. So then this person goes to war. And this might even, we could even be talking about um, anyone that just lived through World War II. But either way, we cannot ignore the fact that World War II was an incredibly traumatic event. In fact, many people are saying that our current COVID experience could mimic the type of trauma that those faced when they were facing World War II with just the same amount of level of uncertainty, depression, hopelessness, uh, not a lot of truth. There was so much propaganda back then. So either way, if you think about that cultural state, that's traumatic. And, and again, this isn't an isolated micro event that happened to someone in particular. This was cultural. This was systemic. And so what happens when, let's say, this World War II vet comes home saw a lot of death, a lot of warfare, warfare, a lot of atrocious things, how do they cope? Now, someone who has done a lot of work and has positive role modeling and has the resources and education, well, maybe this World War II vet went to therapy. Maybe they started meditating, doing yoga, journaling about their feelings and their experiences. Yeah, if you're laughing, <laughs> <laughs> it's because the majority of people did not. And here's the thing, when we don't have the tools and the validation to say, whoa, what you went through was really traumatic, well then how do people typically cope with trauma? It's through maladaptive coping mechanisms, alcoholism, substance abuse in general, anger, rage, fear, anxiety, depression, PTSD, flashbacks, inability to sleep, coping with binging, food, anything they can get their hands on. So how then when this person goes to have a family and their own trauma wasn't really validated or no one's actually addressing it, they're just seeing someone who is um, pulling themselves up from their bootstraps, going to work every day, you know, manning up and just continuing to, to provide for their family and um, create a more stable 
family. Okay, so that then ignores all of those maladaptive coping mechanisms that then create attachment issues with their own children that then create discourse and tension in their marriage, their partnership, leaving children feeling unloved, not getting enough attention, unwanted, and developing their own type of shame stories and belief systems. So then how does that person grow up? Once again, if they don't have the tools and the validation of someone say, holy cow, yeah, you grew up in an alcoholic home, or you grew up where you know there was bullying all around, you were abused, yeah. So if they don't have that validation and then the tools to say, yeah, I probably need to like get help on this. I need to look differently at how I look at myself and the world. I need to not cope with unhealthy coping mechanisms. Again, if you're laughing, it's because the majority of people haven't done this because again, their experience is invalidated as traumatic. So then they go to have kids. And this mom, let's say, is feeling like the only way to be loved is to perform, to be perfect, to get the perfect grades and be have the perfect outfit and have the perfect children in the perfect home. What sort of pressures, expectations, is that gonna put on our own children? Are her own children gonna feel unconditionally loved and supported? Are her own children gonna feel safe? If they then feel like, well, I have to be perfect to make mom happy so that she feels like she's good enough in this world. Now, a kid may not actually have that entire internal conversation, but do you understand then how our own stuff that we don't deal with trickles down to the next generation because it impacts how the next generation feels and believes about themselves and how they should show up in the world. And I'm just taking a very small, (laughs) small sample, but you can hopefully see how generational trauma can affect so many different cultures, races, ethnicities, religions, based on oppression that has happened based on cultural systemic trauma that has happened. Think about even as early as, you know, the Irish immigrants, right? I mean, not that long ago, there was so much racism just amongst white people. And then, gosh, we have to talk about the entire African American community, the Asian American community now. How is that uncertainty, that lack of safety, that fear, How does that trickle then into not the healthiest coping mechanisms that then inform how a child believes about themselves and the world? Okay, this is something that we can continue to go back to. If you have questions, concerns, feedback, please let's talk about it. But this is why it's so important when people say, I'm stopping the cycle. That's it. I no longer am going to hold on to this story about myself that then will dictate how my children see themselves and the world. I will no longer engage in this behavior. I'm going to start setting boundaries so my children don't see me buckle under the pressure of needing to please everyone else, right? So this is where our own work and our own storytelling has to have more clarity, authenticity, so that we can operate out of a much much more grounded place so we don't continue the cycle. Thanks so much for listening this week. See you again next week.